Okay, for those of you that I have not met, I'm Bob Hoffman. I'm the old guy in pediatric ophthalmology, and the purpose of this visit today is to talk about some of the logistics of uh, your interaction with things over at primary with the pediatric ophthalmology service so you have a better idea what's going on and what to do and hopefully what not to do. And um, also when you're being asked to do something that you just plain don't have to do. Um, and so we're going to kind of go through a little bit about, you know, who's on the service in terms of attendings because we're adding somebody, um, where our staff are located, and um, uh, where we are seeing patients because you may get a call about a patient that was seen at Riverton or up in Layton, and you need to know that, yes, indeed, we do have people seeing patients there. Um, in terms of the docs, um, myself, Dave Drees, Mimi or Marielle Young, Leah Owen. Leah was here in your shoes not long ago. Um, she's a, a, an MD PhD researcher, half time, clinician half time. Uh, came back from doing a fellowship at Charleston and joined us. Uh, Griffin Jardine was a medical student here. Some of you may know him. Uh, Griffin was a resident in Oregon, fellow in Indiana, and is starting in about two weeks. So please take it easy on him. Um, I don't want him to run out the door screaming. The other person that you may recognize shortly is Julie Harmon. Julie um, was our head tech at, at uh, primary. And Julie went off uh, to Los Angeles, trained as an orthoptist, and is joining us in a couple of weeks. And we're very thrilled to have her. That is going to ramp up our resident teaching in, and staff teaching in terms of motility issues. She'll be in clinics doing complicated adult motility measurements. Um, I think it'll be a big plus and um, you know it isn't entirely clear where she's going to be but I did set things up we designed the new clinic at primary so that if we divide the clinic in half have two docs seeing patients there's one long lane for orthoptic type motility measurements because orthoptists tend to get pretty wound up about having long lanes and uh, I, I put that there purposefully so that they could have that lane, they can see patients and, and hopefully it'll all work. Um, one of the kind of ongoing duties um, that in my practice career has changed, when I was a resident, when I was a medical student here, the junior resident of the two residents per year usually second year, had the duty to do retinopathy prematurity screening. They were never seen by an attending. Attendings were not involved. Why? Well, if they found bad ROP, you sign them up for the blind school. There was not much to do. And so it was passed on from resident to resident, and that has changed enormously over the years. And now it is very involved. We take photographs of every child we examine uh, with the retcam, uh, either uh, Siri or Mel go around, Mel's learning how to do it, and Siri Fry has been our mainstay in terms of uh, photography in the NICU. But we do regular scheduled screening exams midweek, and depending on the attending schedules, Tuesday, Wednesday, um, at primary um, and at the U. Uh, we used to do them at IMC. When Scott Larson left, I lost the manpower to continue that, and that may change uh, in the near future. Um, those ROP exams are something that as a second year on our service, you will participate in. You know, the idea, and those of you that have been there, and the idea is that I look at both eyes when you're there with me on every kid. You look at one eye, and while I'm taking care of the paperwork, you're finishing up, you're looking, and the, the idea is to get you used to examining kids in the NICU, how to do it safely, how to use the nurse effectively, how to use the OTs to schmooze the kids, um, you know, it's gotten fairly elaborate. I think it's a good thing. That is also a good thing. And one of my purposes in mentioning this is you may get called when you're on call to do a consult in the NICU. And one of the questions, perfectly reasonable to ask is, is this urgent, if it's on Monday, that it be done today, or if it's on Friday, or could it wait until the next time that one of the attendings is gonna be doing ROP exams midweek? And if it's something that could wait, have them put it on the schedule, have them listed as a regular consult, and then we'll see it together. It gets staffed right then, and, 
And, and you know, that's a perfectly reasonable way to do that, and it'll decrease your workload in terms of doing stuff during the week. And, and I have absolutely no problem with that. If they say that, you know, it's, it's urgent, uh, this time of year, you know, new house staff, you have to still think, is it really urgent? Or are we just doing it because we want to impress the senior resident that we managed to get ophthalmology to show up within half an hour of the time we called them? Uh, be that as it may, if they say it's urgent, I would probably go see them. And if you get called, and you will, by somebody in the NICU saying, Dr. Drees saw baby Smith last week, and we think the baby is going to go home, we need to know if they can go home on oxygen, 100% of the time, that call has to be forwarded to an attending. Okay, there are huge medical legal implications associated with the response to that question. So please do not take it upon yourselves to try to wing it and answer it and save us from being bothered. It is always okay to call if you cannot find somebody else. My cell number and, and home number are on this and Elaine has this, should be on the list of things you have in lectures. You're welcome to call me because we need to weigh into that because if we send a kid home and they show up with a total retinal detachment, I mean, that may happen, but we want to know that we didn't contribute to it in some way. And I do not want to put the burden of that decision on you folks. That's something that, that's why they pay me the big bucks, right? Not, but it's okay. Um, now, what about the call you get from Jordan Valley Hospital or Lakeview Hospital and they say, we have a baby that has to be seen, we want you to come see them, or we want you to give us advice about this kid. The advice questions, they get sent to an attending. If we're giving advice to somebody in an outside hospital, that probably should come from an attending level. It could be answered the next day, after hours, it could certainly go to the attending on anterior segment call. After hours coverage for peds in general, particularly for trauma and things of that sort, um, is shared with the anterior segment call person. So that is the attending responsible after hours. The reason it's set up that way, we rotate in that. I mean, I don't anymore because I'm old, but the rest of the crew does. Uh, turns out I managed to get our department to go along with this idea that if you, when you turn 60, you don't have to take call anymore. It's a great thing. And uh, um, if, you know, you'll get there someday. Um, it, it's my enthusiasm for taking care of open globes and 80 year olds at three in the morning left a long time ago. But rather than taking when it was just me and being on call every night, rotate call with the anterior segment folks. That is how that coverage goes. There are some things where they will not be comfortable and they'll ask you to call us. And that would, you know, the cert circumstances um, and you know, but there's nothing magic about closing a corneal laceration in a three-year-old or looking, fishing fireworks debris out of a child's eye and trying to decide if it's an open globe. That doesn't require a pediatric ophthalmologist. It requires somebody with experience in anterior segment skills, may need to involve a retina person as well. Um, and you need to use your judgment on that for the junior residents. Sometimes it's hard to know what you don't know so I would use your connection to the more senior residents liberally because they may know in an instant what it is you need to look at or what needs to happen, and it's worth a call. Um, you know, for the fellows, how many fellows do we have? Any fellows here that accidentally showed up this morning? No, good, okay. Hopefully they're off doing something else, getting coffee or whatever. But with the fellows, it's a new experience as an attending. Our fellows rotate call is anterior segment attendings, the, the anterior segment fellows, you know, cornea, glaucoma, and you know, be aware that this is their first experience. And some of them it's their first ever experience as an attending. And so you need to kind of help get them through it. And if you think they need to get help, you might want to prod them in that direction. It's a good thing to do as a resident. Um, but if you get calls, you know, you do not need to go to Intermountain Medical Center or to Utah Valley Hospital or something if somebody calls. And, and yes, in the past, we have had residents do that um, because they thought it was part of what they needed to do. And if there's any question about something like that, call me. And if somebody's really belligerent about it, uh, get an attending on the phone with them. It's much better to have them mad at me than mad at you. They can hurt you, they can't hurt me. Um, 
and, and I'm not too worried about what they might say or do. Now, vacations and meetings, there, with one exception, is always one of the PEDS attendings in town, and that'll probably change. There'll probably always be one here. But APOS, or National Pediatric Ophthalmology Meeting, which typically happens sometime in the spring, March, April, um, depending on the location, we have, you know, all gone. And the idea with that is we arrange ROP exams and that, so we kind of do them before somebody leaves town and try to juggle things that typically leave town on a Wednesday after doing ROP exams and we're back by Sunday night. Um, but I've instructed every member of our division to have their cell phone with, and if somebody has a question about something, you call. The resident who is on our service at that point tends to get dumped on a bit in terms of dealing with some extra calls and duties. On the other hand, you get to run the PEDS service, which is kind of fun. I mean, 30 years ago, I used to leave town for two weeks, leave the second year resident on the service in charge, and never hear from anybody for two weeks. And they took care of everything. So things have changed a bit, and I'm not, it's probably not okay to do that anymore. And it, you know, again, if you feel like you're being dumped on, you can't take care of something, always reasonable to call somebody more senior. And I also try to leave some attending coverage where somebody knows that you may be calling them about a consult. Because a lot of the other attendings have had a fair amount of experience dealing with kids and they're happy to help you. Um, as far as your vacations, it's always okay to take vacations. You know, I mean, on our service, you need to kind of juggle that against what you're gonna lose in terms of not being here. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it's, it's all good. We will find a way. I think it is good to have somebody to cover consults and be available for stuff if at all possible. Um, and uh, we've kind of gotten used to that coverage and it's a little hard. You guys do an enormous job taking care of consults and I sincerely appreciate it. Um, the outside clinics are just that. They're clinics. They're not inpatient facilities. Um, there are some peds beds now at Riverton, so I can't say that entirely, but basically what we do is we have university clinics in Orem, at Riverton, in Layton that are on Epic. You can pull up any note if you have access to Epic from there, uh, from somebody if you're trying to figure out what it was that Dr. Trees did with a patient in, in uh, uh, Layton or uh, what Dr. Owen did when she saw a patient at Riverton. Riverton, if you haven't been out there, and we want to try to get folks out there with this change in number of residents and, and consult coverage, um, it is a wonderful clinic. Uh, there is a large population of children in the southwest part of the valley, and they are busy in that clinic. It's a, it's a, it's a good place. Um, and they also um, have an OR that is staffed by pediatric anesthesiologists, the same group that covers us at primary, and so it also is a place where we hope to expand our surgical experience. Um, the uh, neonatal follow-up uh, clinic, um, if you get called about something with that, our involvement in that is ending the 23rd of August. Uh, it, due to a variety of reasons, um, it is making more sense to just roll those patients into our clinics. And so that's what's gonna happen there so that while residents have gone there, I think it's been a good way to, because we only have one exam room, it doesn't really lend itself to turning you loose saying, here you go use this room and see patients. We see them together, but you also get to see how I finesse some of these kids who have had many too many healthcare interventions and scream the moment they come in the room and how we try to get useful information without sedating them, without putting them to sleep, playing games with them. And to that extent, it is a good opportunity to examine patients together. Um, we'll often have a neonatology fellow or a PEDS resident hanging out with us at the same time. So it gets to be a little short on oxygen in the room um, and it's not very productive. Um, we can see the patients more effectively in our clinic, so I'm not entirely sad that it's ending. Um, American Fork. I know everybody who's been on the PEDS service has experienced American Fork. The American Fork Training School does not have children, by and large. It used to have children, and it had children with severe developmental disabilities. Um, when I was in medical school here, it was a wonderful place to go as part of your neurology rotation to see firsthand a lot of syndromes. You wanna see Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. You wanna see various things in action and what it does to people. It was great. 
What it became was a storehouse for unplaceable adults as people were moved out into community health centers, out of mental health institutions. And for a variety of reasons, um, it sort of got dropped on me. I think someone used the word school liberally, implying children. And um, it wasn't true. And so what I did initially with that was to move that to the residents and have the residents go. And it turns out they paid me for going out there. So I just had them pass the pay on to the residents. It was a good deal. Uh, unfortunately, GME found out and I got in some trouble. Um, and it turns out the department wanted to take the money and still have you go to the fork, but not pay you at all. And that wasn't acceptable. Um, so the compromise is that you get credit that you can go spend at the bookstore and it's, it's, a, it's still a pretty good deal. You're essentially getting paid, but you have to spend it at the bookstore. So that um, the department isn't taking the money and having you do the work, um, you are getting taken care of. And I think there's value in going there and examining patients who at times don't understand what you're trying to do. Some of them can really hurt you. Um, if nothing else, they can cause you to slip and fall in a puddle of urine. Um, but there are patients there who can bite. They can bite hard. When I was a medical student, a student had his thumb removed by one of the patients there. So if someone grabs your thumb with both hands and takes a very close look at it, start asking for help because the next place it's going is right in his mouth. Um, but I, I, you know, it's useful because you will see some of my developmentally impaired patients, if you're in practice in the area here, when they grow up to be adults. And I think knowing how to reasonably and compassionately deliver care to those folks to help them interact with the world around them is a good thing. There are also surgical cases that come out of there. They're basically the result of trauma. You got traumatic retinal detachments, cataracts, glaucoma, due to repeated injuries, self-injuries usually. And those, if it's something that you're capable of doing, find an attending, schedule it, get it done, and uh, more power to you. Um, if there are issues out there, call me, but I have, truth be known, not been to that clinic in many years. My name is on there because I was initially conned into going there um, but at this point, I think you know, if you decide that something's changing and it's not a useful experience, I need to know. But otherwise, what ideally you find time and it'll be passed on resident to resident to go out there when you're not doing something that is more useful on our service. I would particularly urge you not to cancel OR time. Usually there's some down at downtime administrative time in my schedule, you know, a half day or two a month where you can find time to go out there and you just bargain with them and, 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 and set it up. Now, this thing doesn't, does it? Yeah, no, it does do that. How about that? That's cool. So in terms of service coverage, we touched on the consults. You know, knowing where Well Baby Nursery is, NICU at the U, in terms of peds are, are, are essential and making sure your little badge gets you in there. Um, the ER at primary is a place that you'll come to know well. In our clinic, you will find instruments. Uh, there are lid speculums, scleral depressors, uh, there are drops, um, there are indirects on the wall in every exam room. If you take one, it's fine. Please bring it back, put it back in the charger when you're done. Um, and those lid speculums and scleral depressors do not come back to the Moran OR. They don't go to the retina clinic. Please put them in our clinic. There's a little basin on the back counter by the autoclave where they clean that stuff up. They're very expensive. We do have to pay for them. Um, it's my expectation that they have them available you know, for you. And if you don't know where they are, grab one of your senior residents or come by clinic when one of us is a clinic. Our techs can show you around. Um, your key card for primary should get you into our clinic. That's the expectation. If it doesn't, stop at the security desk. If they tell you you need some special dispensation for me to do it, get whatever form they want, I'll sign it. Because you, all that stuff now is key card access. And after hours, it is my expectation that you be able to get into our clinic to get what you need. And I trust you to get in there and, you know, and, and then make sure that whatever it is gets back to, to where it needs to be. Um, there are tonneau pens there. Tonneau pens are particularly expensive. I think that there is one in the resident call box anyways or not. So you shouldn't need one, but if you find you do, 
you know, it's fine. The other place you can get one if you're really stuck at primary, the OR. We have Indirex, Tano pens, and various things. They usually live in our room, in room eight, in the closet, or they're hanging on the wall. And if you're really stuck, you can get that there. That's also where the ret cam lives. So if you're trying to get the ret cam, because I'm coming in to take pictures at night of some child with you who's, you know, had abusive head trauma and has retinal hemorrhages, um, if you call the OR, they'll have it at the front desk for you. You just wrap it all up, take it to where we're going to use it. You take it back. They want a stamper thing from the kid so that they can bill for the use. And um, I think that that, you know, is, is you know, again, another useful place to know ER, OR, and our clinic. Um, and if you really feel lost around the Children's Hospital, get one of your senior residents, or I'm happy to give you a tour, because knowing where the inpatient units are, the NICU, ICU, and that, I think is, is, is also very helpful. Um, you also ought to know where the resident lounge is. Um, they have much better food for the residents at primary than they do for the attendings. Um, so of the two lounges, I would definitely find a way to get into the Peds resident lounge. Um, they eat like kings for lunch every day. That's how they get them to go to their lectures. They don't stay after hours like you guys do or come in early. Um, that's what pediatricians do. They don't come in early. Um, but um, it, they do have a good lounge, and if you can get one of your Peds resident colleagues to help you figure out how to break in there, I, I'd go for it. Um, Post-ops. You know, I, I can tell you for a fact that if you have an issue with one of my post-ops, I want to hear from you. It is always okay to call. You know, if there's a question and you think one of my post-op cataracts has endophthalmitis, you're not bothering me by calling. You know, I, I'm grateful to hear about it. If there are questions, the things that commonly come up in years past, we put a lot of Crawford tubes in lacrimal systems, they get pulled out. That's why I don't put them in many patients anymore. But if you do get called and you have a big loop of tubing sticking out, the best thing to do is to have the parent tape it to the bridge of the nose and call us in the morning. Having tried this many times, Crawford tubes cannot ever be put back in. You could stuff the whole thing in the lacrimal sac, you could make the parents feel really good, but generally before they even get to their car in the parking lot, the whole thing's gonna be sticking out again and they're gonna be driving you nuts. So the problem is that not knowing exactly what's on the lower end in the nose, there could be hardware attached to it, there could be a, you know, a Brazilian knots, you know, down there, to quote George Bush. Um, lots of knots in the nose. Um, I put them in, I sew them temporarily to the, to the lateral nasal wall. So there may be suture attached to it. They generally can't get a big loop out unless they've managed to rip the suture out of the tissue. But you might try rotating the tubing out. I generally talk to whoever put it in first to figure out what they did on the other end. Um, and, and it may require a trip to the OR. Now, if you're going to go to the OR, you're going to do a sedated exam. It is generally available. First of all, in the OR, you have to have an attending. There is really no exception to that. You at least need to speak to the attending if they're going to have you run in and they're going to meet you because an attending's name needs to be on it if you're gonna to go to the OR. And if you decide to go on your own, I mean, other than some, oh my gosh, emergency, and I really can't think of any with eyes, um, that, uh, you know, other than maybe doing an emergent, you know, lateral canthotomy and upper lower cruise cantholysis, if one of the ENT surgeons has put way too much air um, into an orbit uh, via the sinuses, and you got a central retinal artery occlusion, and I have gotten that phone call to ROR's at primary on a number of occasions. I mean, feel free to do, if you know what to do, to do it, and that is a very useful procedure if you don't know how to do it, to learn how to do, because it can be vision saving in terms of reestablishing circulation um, to the posterior segment. Um, otherwise, you need an attending. Uh, with sedated exams, useful to run through the exercise, being that the kid's gonna be sedated, to have everybody you think might need to look there with you so that they can look at the same time. You know, if you're gonna need an attending to look, let them know you're gonna sedate the kid and say, do you wanna be here? And that's, I think, always a, a good way to approach that so that we don't find out that the, the result is, well, I need to see the kid too, keep him sedated, and I'm driving in from home and I'll be there in an hour. Um, 
probably not a good thing and a little embarrassing in the ER. Um, political issues. Um, you will at times be asked to see patients, certainly at primary and I think at the U, by craniofacial surgery, plastic surgery, ENT, where they are repairing orbital fractures, facial fractures, and they want to know if the eye is okay. It is my firm expectation that we do the right thing for the patient and make sure the eye is okay. It is not my expectation that we only see the patient if our oculoplastics folks are going to take care of the fractures or the lacerations. There are our you know, craniofacial surgeons do a, an exquisite job of taking care of orbital fractures. Um, they do a great job. I think you need to watch the neurosurgeons when they start coming in from the north playing around in the orbit. Um, sometimes they get into trouble, but that's something that needs to be sorted out at the attending level as far as doing that. I think that in general, I would urge you to, you know, and if they call and say, we want you to come to the OR to look at this kid, we have him in the OR, I would touch bases with an attending before you do so they know about it. You can at least put their name on it and they make a good faith effort to try to be there with you. I mean, that often, com if it comes up on Thursday, I'm in the OR anyway. I can walk down the hall, stick my head in the door while you're taking a look at the kid and it's fine. Um, but, you know, I need to be able to say that I actually saw the child and, and looked at them. Um, if, you know, and, and the other question, when do you say when they've got orbital fractures? Well, I'm gonna, I have to get my oculoplastics attending. You know, you have to kind of sort out who's already involved in the patient's care. If there's a service that's gonna take care of the fractures, and they want you to clear the eye, always reasonable to, you know, to ask, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to get oculoplastics involved? Yes or no, they'll tell you. Perfectly reasonable question, but I would never insist you know, thinking that somehow it's something that our oculoplastic surgery folks have to take care of. Because, you know, what with or isolated orbital fractures, certainly I think our folks can do as good or better job than anybody. The other folks can too, and there are some political issues involved. And with the craniofacial surgeons, they're often dealing with multiple, you know, fractures and complicated facial trauma. They're often going to the OR earlier because of the other fractures. They may be doing something combined with neurosurgery, with dural tears, or something of that sort. And so it gets to be complicated. If it seems to be more complicated than you can sort out, I'm happy to talk to you about it. Now, what do we do with abusive head trauma, non accidental trauma? You'll be called numerous times on call to see children where somebody thinks they've been shaken, they're not sure what happened, and they want you to look at them. Um, there is a, a, a program uh, that Julia put together uh, looking, you know, as far as trying to get photos on all these kids, trying to get them seen quickly. And we're currently working out neurosurgery's role as the major impediment to pupillary dilation and how important it is to wait as long as they wait on some of these kids because we need to get a good exam. We need to gather evidence if somebody's actually done something to a child. and. Um, you know, when I was in your shoes, the idea that if a kid had retinal hemorrhages, they were shaken. And that is just plain not true. Um, there are certain patterns, distribution of hemorrhages in conjunction with the story of what happened with the child that may make it fairly clear that that's what happened. But the findings have to be interpreted based on the patient's history and other findings. And so we're mainly an information gathering service in that arena. And it's important that we not make claims that are not true based on undilated exams. So I would urge you, you can say based on an undilated exam that there are hemorrhages or there are not hemorrhages, but as far as the nature, location, distribution of hemorrhages, whether they are multi-layered, superficial, around the optic nerve, throughout the entire retina, whether they're circummacular folds, those are things that come from a dilated exam only. And uh, be careful about that. Um, and as far as saying that you think that something is due to abusive head trauma, um, it is my firm expectation that every child who's got retinal hemorrhages 
be at least discussed with an attending and preferably examined by an attending. And the attendings involved are typically either one of the PEDS attendings, usually me, or one of the retina fellows, and they quickly learn to be very good at this, um, or one of the retina attendings, although it's harder to track the attendings down. Uh, they're busy fixing retinal detachments. It's the life of a busy retina attending. And um, we try to get photos on all kids. There is a push to try to have them seen within 24 hours of their admission to the hospital. Um, again, the stumbling block being whether they are stable enough per neurosurgery to dilate. And you'll hear more about that, and I'll send information out. There are currently meetings kind of going on between Tony Lasky, who is the child abuse specialist pediatrician in charge of safe and healthy families at primary, Doug Brockmeyer, chief of pediatric neurosurgery, and myself trying to sort out just how we want to approach this. You should be aware that there are ongoing studies that some people are participating in here with Brittany Coates, who is a uh, 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 just a rocket scientist researcher, uh, uh, mechanical engineer at bioengineering here, who is doing active research looking at the mechanical forces and trying to unravel really what is happening in abusive head trauma. She's doing very elegant research. If you have any interest in that area, it'd be a good thing to get involved with. Julia's doing a project with uh, Brittany and I right now uh, looking at vessel tortuosity um, in our RETCAM photos. And uh, hopefully that'll lead to something that we can use. During the weekdays, there is a system set up. So if you see a child who's got hemorrhages, Siri or Glenn are available. They know they may be called. They'll get the ret cam. They'll come take pictures for you. Probably useful to have an attending come at the same time so you can get everybody to see the patient. And what else do we have on here? Oh, and as far as this, basically the protocol that Julia was kind enough to put together, if they've got a circumacular fold and it's a weekday, we want the photographers to get an OCT as well. They can use handheld OCT at bedside if the patient's dilated. It turns out that documenting the structure of the retina, the presence or absence of vitreous traction on the fold, which is the presumed mechanism of it, traction on the retina as dissimilar structures are moving to and fro with acceleration and deceleration of the head. Um, and if the safe and healthy families attending wants photos and it's after hours, please arrange them. And again, I'm happy to come in. Retina fellows uh, should know how to use the um, uh, RETCAM. Uh, James Zimmerman in particular is very good with it. Um, and as far as taking the RETCAM, if you've never used it, it is best to have someone who knows how to use it, preferably one of the attendings when we're doing things in the OR, show you how to use it. It is an $80,000 camera system. I have had at least one of your colleagues drop those lenses on the floor before. They're about $10,000 a pop. Um, it's a very sinking feeling when that bounces off the floor because they generally don't do well after that. Um, if there are problems, uh, you know, you're welcome to call at any point. These are my various numbers. I, I can tell you, I. I, my pager, I think, needs a battery. It's been very quiet for about a month. Um, so <laughs> I've been trying to find a AA battery, but I've not been looking too hard. Um, that home number now basically gets used now for people wanting political contributions. Um, and so uh, be persistent, leave a message uh, that you actually are a human and need to talk to me. Um, but my cell is always with me wherever I am. If it sounds like I am sound asleep, Typically, I am somewhere about 12 hours away, time-wise, in Asia somewhere. And yes, it may be 3 in the morning when it's 3 in the afternoon here. So give me a moment to wake up and we'll talk. Um, as far as your rotations, right now, we have one month, last quarter of the year, where the first-year residents spend time on our service. The goal of that is to kind of learn where things are, get comfortable with examining children. That is a time when our orthoptist will spend time with you tuning up your motility exam, and I think that's just going to be a wonderful thing. Um, when Nikki Batra was being our orthoptist, uh, when her husband, Nick, uh, was our retina fellow, um, that was a good thing. Now, second year, that's the bulk, again, three months of kind of undivided attention to peds, and we do have the opportunity for elective time 
anytime you feel, you know, if you want to come and spend time with one of the attendings that you have not spent time with or do something in particular, all things are negotiable. Um, expectations while you're in clinic are that you focus on, you know, getting maximal benefit out of your time there. Um, you want to learn the peed specific parts of history and exam. You want to make a note in Epic. I'd like you to commit when it was in paper, say put your thoughts down on paper so you're committing what you think about the motility exam, retinoscopy, fundus exam, a diagnosis and what you want to do. And there's room and the resident head can show you where we make that resident note. I think that's a great way to do that, put that in Epic. And then on every patient, if you're doing retinoscopy, you can compare your retinoscopy to what I got. We can talk at the end of the day and at the end of clinic, of every clinic, we talk about questions you have about patients, go through things uh, and issues and consults and try to debrief the clinic in the day. I expect that you'll develop specific skills in measuring vision in kids, doing motility measurements, and just dealing with kids in general. How do you get a small infant you know, to where you can do an anterior segment exam, do a fundus exam? How do you safely use a lid speculum? Because if the child gets a hand free and they grab that lid speculum, you may wind up having to talk to the oculoplastics folks to put the lids back together. That's not a good conversation. And at that point, you probably should find me um, because I'm going to have to talk to some folks on your behalf. Um, initially, you focus on learning the exam skills. Then you work on putting that information together to come up with what you think may be going on with the patient and how that relates to what they came in complaining of and then put that together to come up with a good differential diagnosis, most likely diagnosis, and a plan as to what to do in terms of further testing, management, whether it be medical, optical, surgical. And I want you to gain an understanding as we kind of go through things, how we interact with other services, with peds, retina, glaucoma, um, anterior segment, how we deal with, interact with our support services, and the various pediatric subspecialties and clinical areas at primary. Surgical experience, um, you will start in your first year experience um, that you need loops. We have headlights, but having loops that work and not the cheap ones with a working distance of about 10 inches, uh, because otherwise your face will be in the wound. I'll be continually contaminating myself on your head as you put your head between me and what I'm trying to look at and it won't be a good learning experience and you're going to really sore back. So that at some point you can borrow some from another resident. If you have a lot of refractive air and you want to have your correction in there, uh, Designs for Vision makes probably the best loops that are reasonably priced for residents that are good. Um, Zeiss makes the best loops but they are very expensive and unless you're going to be doing something in peds or oculoplastics where you might use them regularly, it's probably not worth the expenditure and the investment. Um, in terms of the uh, you know, expectation, people come with a variety of, of surgical experiences um, and um, exposures and I've had residents that come in who have been operating regularly for years in the military or doing something. That's a different thing from, I did surgery when I was a third year medical student and I'm terrified of operating on eyes. And, and so your role on my service in particular and with Dr. Patel is to acquire good surgical skills, basic surgical skills and things that are gonna serve you throughout your experience here before you really ramp things up with anterior segment surgery. Um, and um, as long as you are uh, progressing, I mean, that's all that I ask, and, and some residents wind up doing more than others depending on how things go. I mean, the model that Alan Crandall set up here in our program for teaching residents, we've done it for years in peds because typically we're doing a couple of muscles, so the I'm doing one muscle and you're doing the other muscle or doing what you can with the other muscle is a good one. Um, uh, you know, but having residents operating your patients, I can tell you when I was a resident in Michigan, none of the attendings would ever let a resident do any part of a cataract operation on one of their private patients ever. You know, it just wasn't an issue. So you're a lucky group um, to be in a situation where people are sharing that kind of surgery with you. The PED stuff, it's something that we've done, you know, for decades 
just because it lends itself more to that. And, and so, you know, I walk you through repeatedly various parts of the procedure, and then you put things together. And, you know, the expectation is that you become comfortable doing horizontal strabismus surgery, not necessarily vertical surgery, um, while you're on the service. So you can get through a procedure, you could do it safely if that's something that you choose to do in practice, depending on where you're headed. I realize many of you probably won't ever do another muscle surgery um, after you leave our service, um, but I want that you know, skill and, and, and ability to be there. Um, now, as far as your evaluation with this new evaluation, with this committee that of you, you know, reviews things, Mike Teske and I are on that. In the second year, uh, we are the evaluators for the second year residents in that thing when they put all that stuff together. We decided to do that because you spend bulk of your time on one of our services, so we collect that information. And he and I sit down and hash things out in case you wondered where those evaluations come from on that committee. And um, I think, it, you know, we try to do a, a reasonable job of, you know, looking things over in that, but, uh, uh, you know, that whole system has changed many times in my time in this department. And if you have thoughts about it, Renee, I don't know if you have thoughts about it, but, but uh, <laughs> shaking your head. Yeah, it's changed so often. Well, it's, you know, it, it, it uh, well, we had services, unfortunately, where there was virtually no evaluation. And for years, I had a written test and a, a fairly organized thing that we went through on surgical skills. And we're going away from that to this kind of, uh, uh, you know, it's a fairly organized thing that looks at everything. And we have to say where you are based on other residents at your level and, you know, and, and how everything is going and make some sort of narrative comment. And uh, it, it is a lot of work. Um, and um, they don't give us, oh, I think it's getting better. And I think ultimately it'll be useful. My concern is I wanna make sure that when they do that, they are focusing on things that are actually meaningful, that provide an honest assessment. You know, unfortunately, fortunately, I guess the, you know, the bottom line is that almost all the residents that we have come through here do wonderfully, very rarely we wind up with somebody who really struggles in an area. They may have not made a good career choice. They may have other issues going on in their lives. And it's, you know, really a matter of trying to sort out those things and guiding people towards making the right choices in terms of what they want to do. Because our job in reality is to kind of help you along the way in your career. And for the most part, it's a pleasant journey. You know, it's very, very rare. We, you know, we're blessed in that we have very good residents. Um, and, and so it usually, we do not have the problems that some other programs do. Um, as far as practice surgery sessions, that has fallen by the way as far as basic surgical skills. And if anyone is interested in reinstituting that, I am happy to get together with junior residents and go over basic suturing skills, you know, on eye bank eyes and you know get loops and we can sit down and do things i think it is very useful to learn to handle the instruments to pass suture through sclera and to not have the first time you do that be on one of my patients in the or at primary and in past years what we've done is we pass suture deeper and deeper until you do penetrate sclera perforate it and wind up in the vitreous in an eye bank eye and you know, I think that's, that's a, a useful exercise. And if anyone is interested, I'm happy to get involved. Um, as far as reading goes, uh, the basic science course is kind of the core thing. Um, we will have journal club at least two to three times a year. The resident on the service will select articles. And I've typically tried to make that topic oriented. So we'll pick a topic that somebody's interested in, select some reasonable articles, and, um, and then discuss them. Typically do that over at my house, although as we grow, um, my house is becoming too small to hold the entire group, so we may have to make some changes in that, we'll see. Um, and you are welcome to um, use uh, you know, my bookshelf um, and hang out in my office and do whatever you wanna do, but those are on here, some of the 
things that I would suggest as far as texts. There is, for the abusive head trauma thing, both in the library, in our clinic, and on my bookshelf, the book that uh, uh, Rob Parrish and Lori Frazier edited that I wrote all the uh, um, eye stuff for, and all those pictures were taken in our uh, uh, ICU mainly, or the OR, most of them taken by me, so they're not the highest quality photos, but they're okay. And, um, you know, that may be a useful thing to look at to get an idea of, when we're talking about circummacular folds, you know, what is that, what does it look like, and how do we tell if hemorrhages are superficial or deep, and, and um, those are things that'll come with experience, but some of those pictures may be useful to you. And, uh, you know, as far as your reading in general, for the junior residents, you know, my recommendation, and it worked when I was a resident, is every day you should spend an hour reading about things in general with ophthalmology, an hour reading about things and whatever you're rotating in, and then additional time on an interesting patient or two from the day. Because patients will stick with you when you read about them. And do we have anything else on here? I don't remember. Okay. And so if you are having, you know, as far as at primary, HELP2 is currently the in-house, they made it themselves, electronic medical record system at primary. That's going to change. Uh, they're going to go with iCentra. You'll hear more about that. There'll be training sessions. It will be an ordeal. Um, and I apologize for having to deal with yet another EMR. Um, I tried to get them to go with Epic, um, and they had other thoughts. Uh, they wanted control of data. They wanted customization that Epic was not able to give them. Um, and if you are having issues with, you know, parking or, uh, um, you know, whatnot at primary, if you're there late at night and, and, and people aren't letting you park, I'm happy to get involved in that too. Uh, you know, if you're here late at night, parking far away in the parking garage is not my idea of an acceptable situation. I think if you're coming to Moran late at night, it's perfectly acceptable if you're here at three or four in the morning to pull right up outside the door with the elevator that goes up. If you're worried, call security, have them meet you and escort you to where you're going. Um, you know, meet a patient at the ER where there are more people around. Um, we do have, you know, people that ride tracks up here and sleep outside our OR doors occasionally on the second floor and on the fourth floor. Um, I know because my wife volunteers at Crossroads and she gives a lot of those folks their tracks tickets. Um, and they use them to come up here to hang out, particularly when it's cold outside. And um, so don't get in a situation you're uncomfortable with after hours. Questions, concerns, comments from the uh, more senior residents about things? One thing I just want to bring up is if you guys don't have access to the Pete's clinic, um, because I didn't have access, you can email Chris Coopins and then she'll give you access if that you have access. That actually is good. And Chris is, Chris Coomans is C-O-O-M-A-N-S. She is our clinic manager. Um, my long-term secretary, Amy Beagley, uh, has departed. Uh, Tom, and I, I, I haven't even learned his last name yet, I'm embarrassed, but Tom is my new uh, secretary. Uh, he was here for a day or two, and then they sent him off for training and uh, indoctrination, I think in Epic. And so I'll learn his last name. He seems like a nice guy. He's sitting where Amy was. Amy uh, Karpowitz is currently, uh, Bernstein's secretary is currently uh, helping with my stuff. So if there are issues, she can be of help to you as well. But if all else fails, I mean, I'm around, it's okay to call or come by clinic. And uh, thanks for being here. Have a good day. Thanks.